CD1 Module 1 Getting Ahead Unit 1 Education Listening You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Extract 1 How long have you been designing clothes? I first started making my own clothes when I was 11. I spent most of my free time making things. When my friends saw my designs, they asked me to make clothes for them. Back then, my family was suffering from financial difficulties. It was very stressful. I was able to make some extra money on the side. This couldn't have happened at a better time. I had a great sense of pride that I was able to make a contribution. I would work after school. When most kids my age were hanging out, I was in my bedroom poring over designs. It was exhausting, but it didn't matter to me because I loved it. How do you manage to study for a degree and manage your business? It's tough, especially this year as I'm in my final year and I have a project and lots of exams. The business has been really challenging this year as well. Sometimes it's hard to do everything, but I do my best. I'm studying fashion design technology. It's been really helpful to me. There have been so many changes taking place in the fashion world, and I wanted to keep up to date with the technology. There are also modules in business and management in my degree, which have helped me understand managing a business better. I think at the end of the day, it was worth going to university because the experience served to broaden my mind and challenge me. Unfortunately, because I've been so busy, I haven't really had the chance to do much socialising. That's something I regret. Extract 2 More and more universities are adopting virtual learning environments. However, many feel this form of education is inadequate because it reduces face-to-face -face interaction between students and teachers. I believe that if e-learning is carried out correctly, it can enhance the learning experience. An e-learning course allows students to do self-study tutorials online and access multimedia course material. There are also enormous online libraries, forums, bulletin boards and chat rooms, which allow students and staff to discuss topics and get supplementary materials. Some universities are even able to provide counselling and study support services online. There are various advantages to e-learning. Firstly, distance learners with busy lifestyles are able to study anytime, anywhere, as long as they have access to the internet. Self-paced tutorials can be done at the learner's own pace. I think this is particularly important for those trying to manage study with work. Various learning styles and abilities are catered for. The overall cost of learning is reduced for the institution and the student. However, there are some disadvantages worth considering. Students who are not disciplined enough to study on their own may fall behind. The lack of social interaction may cause some students to become isolated. Problems with internet connections can cause frustration and slow down the learning process. Overall, I think that the advantages outweigh the drawbacks. E-learning provides a wealth of information to students, and in using the software, learners gain an additional skill. Extract 3 Did you know that learning a musical instrument can improve a child's behaviour? It can even improve their memory and increase their intelligence. That's interesting. I've just read an article about it. Researchers have discovered that playing a musical instrument makes the left side of the brain bigger. This means students that play an instrument can remember more. In addition, it's been shown that children who play musical instruments behave better. They're more likely to demonstrate qualities such as respect, politeness, willingness and trust. I think this is very interesting research and it could have an important impact on society as a whole. It's a change from some of the research I've read about, which is a waste of time and is of no benefit to anyone. I know what you mean. I suppose the connection between the children's behavior and learning music comes from the fact that music does influence who we are as people and being part of a music group 
can offer young people support when they are having a difficult time. I think learning a musical instrument should be compulsory for primary school children. Maybe it would reduce the crime rate among young people. I agree. In fact, so does the government. They plan to dramatically increase the number of primary age children learning musical instruments. Unit 2. Work and money. Listening. You will hear a radio interview with a forensic scientist offering advice to students interested in pursuing a career in this field. For questions 1 to 9, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Forensic science has gained popularity in the last decade because of TV programs such as CSI, Waking the Dead and Cracker, which portray it as being glamorous and cool. The reality is, of course, completely different. Here to provide us with an insight into forensic science as a career, and to dispel some of the myths created by various TV series, is leading forensic scientist Dr. Robert Saunders. Welcome to the show. Good evening. And thank you. Let me start by saying that forensic science is nothing like it is on TV. Our labs and equipment are definitely not as flashy as those on CSI. And while our staff are certainly experts in their fields, they are not knowledgeable about every subject like the cast members on the show. The forensic scientists on these shows manage to solve crimes in a matter of minutes. This is not the case in real life. Searching and examining the scene of a crime for clues to support a criminal case is a slow, painstaking process. I do agree with one thing shown on TV, though. Forensic scientists do often have to work very unsociable hours. For instance, you might be called to examine a crime scene at 2 a.m. on a freezing cold winter's night and have to spend hours outside going over the scene looking for anything that might help solve the crime. This might look exciting on TV, but actually doing it is a different matter. How would you define forensic science? Forensic science is the application of the field of science to the law. We use the science part to solve crimes. The evidence that we collect is analyzed and then presented in a court of law so the jury can make a decision about the guilt or innocence of a person. This aspect of the job is the most satisfying because that's when you realize that all the hours of hard work you have spent on a case have really been worth it. As a forensic scientist, you are doing the public a service and that gives you a great sense of achievement. Okay, and what qualities does one need to be a forensic scientist? To work in forensics, you need to have a good background in science and a lot of patience and perseverance. Also, you need to be a good communicator, both orally and in writing, because you may have to appear in front of a jury and explain complex scientific ideas in layman's terms. You should be a team player, as you will work closely with the police, other forensic scientists and crime officers. And what qualifications and experience are needed to become a forensic scientist? The minimum qualification required is a science degree. You don't have to study a forensic science degree. However, many universities are now offering forensic science as an undergraduate course. Competition for forensic jobs is fierce. We had 500 applicants this year for entry-level positions, and we were only able to take on 10. What can make you stand out from the crowd is relevant work experience in a lab. I can't stress this enough. If you are serious about a career in this area and you don't already have some lab experience, you should be thinking about arranging to do this as soon as possible. A good option is to volunteer your services to a local scientific laboratory in your area. 
And what about career prospects? In terms of career prospects, forensic science encompasses many different areas. And due to its interdisciplinary nature, there are many career options available. You can work for the police force, in private labs. Module 1. Roundup. Listening. You will hear a radio interview with an expert giving advice to adults and children who are the victims of bullying. For questions 1 to 9, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. is one of the main causes of stress and depression in both adults and children. Here with us today is leading educational psychologist, Dr. Susanna Moore, who is going to give us some advice and tips on how to deal with bullying, whether it be at school or in the workplace. Welcome to the show, Susanna. Thank you. Bullying is often a childhood problem, so I'd like to start by talking about bullying and young people. First, let me define bullying for our listeners. Bullying can include teasing or name-calling, nasty gossip, abusive or threatening text messages or emails, intimidation and violence. For some children, bullying is the most stressful experience of their lives. It can lead to absence from school and health and behavioural problems which carry on into adult life. Some children are more susceptible to bullying than others. For example, children who are different in some way to their peers. Obese children or those with disabilities are usually targets for bullies. Those with shy or timid personalities are also vulnerable. Something that is very common among victims of bullying is that they feel very ashamed about what is happening and don't want to tell anyone. Fear of further bullying also prevents many children from talking. This is where parents and teachers play a crucial role. If your child is being bullied, Help them understand that it's not their fault and that they don't deserve such treatment. Talk about what you can do together to stop the bullying. Make sure you record any incidences of bullying your child tells you about. If the bullying is taking place at school, book an appointment to see the form teacher and try to discuss the matter in a calm manner. If we have any young listeners who are being bullied, my advice is talk to someone you trust a parent, a teacher, an older relative, or even a friend. You don't have to suffer in silence. When someone bullies you, try to act as confident as you can and tell them to stop. Then try to calmly move away from them. Don't hit the people who bully you, as this can be used as evidence against you. Now, I've talked about the victims of bullying, but what about the cause of the problem? What about the bullies themselves? Research has shown that bullies are often victims of bullying themselves, and they are just taking out their own frustration on others. Parents of bullies need to talk to their children and make them understand what effects their actions have on others. If it is a group of students who are carrying out the bullying, there might be peer pressure, and it could be helpful to talk to some of the parents of the other kids involved. Now, let's look at bullying in the workplace. This happens when someone, a colleague or superior, tries to intimidate or humiliate another worker, usually in front of other colleagues. It can also include being blamed for problems caused by others and being treated unfairly. If you think you are being bullied, it is important you discuss it with a person that you trust, so you can determine if you are being bullied. Sometimes what seems like bullying may not be. For example, if you have a lot more work to do and you feel this is unfair, think about what's behind your heavy workload. It could be due to a change in the way your organisation is run. Maybe you just need to be flexible about the way you work so you can adjust more easily to the change. If you are being bullied at work, then first talk to someone about how to resolve the problem informally. For example, someone from the Human Resources Department or the Employee Trade Union. They should be able to give you advice about how to deal with the situation. If you feel you are able to talk to the bully, 
You might discover that the bullying is not intentional. The bully may not even realize that their behavior is intimidating. Decide what you want to say in advance and describe specific incidents and how they made you feel. Again, I can't stress this enough. Keep a record of all incidents with dates. People are more likely to take you seriously if you have written evidence. If the bullying still persists, then the next step would be to make an email. Module 2. Around the globe. Unit 3. Travel. 2. Listening for gist. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about different types of holidays. Choose from the list, A to H, the type of holiday that the person is talking about. Speaker 1. As we tumbled along the river in our raft, I tried to ignore its deafening roar. I was using all my strength to row through the powerful rapids that seemed intent on capsizing our raft. At that moment, I experienced a strange but not altogether unpleasant surge of fear. This must be what adrenaline junkies seek. It was quite invigorating. I was on the Franklin River in Tasmania, and my team consisted of seven other people, including two guides. The following day, after a morning of zipping through a forest of eucalyptus trees, we embarked on a hike up a snow-capped mountain. After an exhausting five-hour trek, those of us that could still stand were rewarded with a breathtaking view. I came back from my holiday fitter and wiser, and with an intense desire to do it all again. Speaker 2. I have a hectic lifestyle. I work long hours and I have little time for rest and recreation. So when I go on holiday, all I want to do is laze by the beach with a good book. When my friend told me that she had discovered an idyllic island paradise, I was all ears. The paradise in question was Zanzibar, an island off the east coast of Africa. I stayed there with my husband in a lovely spa hotel. After a few days of spa treatments, healthy food, lying on the beach and swimming in azure-colored water, I was completely chilled out. I even went snorkeling one day. It was fascinating to watch the brilliant flashes of color as the fish zipped past me. I felt happy and refreshed by the end of the holiday. Speaker 3 on our 40th wedding anniversary, my wife and I decided to go on a trip down the Nile. My wife is a big Agatha Christie fan, and when she discovered the ship was holding a death on the Nile themed night, she was over the moon. We were very pleased with the facilities on the ship. I particularly enjoyed doing lengths in the Olympic sized pool at the break of dawn, just as a pearly light broke over the horizon. The voyage would have been perfect if it were not for the quality of the food on board, which was, to say the least, of a questionable standard. In fact, my wife took ill for three days after eating from the buffet. Speaker 4. The very thought of this sport used to invoke feelings of dread. So when my friend Sophie suggested I join her on a beginner's course in the Alps, I refused point blank. Fortunately, Sophie doesn't give up easily, and after a few days, I gave in. As the cable car made its jerky journey up the snow-covered mountain, I glared angrily at Sophie. She flashed me a happy grin and pointed at a man expertly gliding down the mountain. Our first lesson was not as bad as I thought it would be. In fact, despite my initial terror, I quite enjoyed it. Actually, it's not as hard as it looks. Once I got over my fear of falling, I found myself smugly gliding down hills, and at one point, I was even able to look up and take in the beautiful snowy scenery. Speaker 5 Every year we go on holiday to the Lake District. Staying in hotels is too expensive for a family of six, so we prefer to find a nice site and pitch our tents. Anyway, the kids enjoy the sense of adventure that goes with sleeping outdoors. Last summer, we stayed in Cartmel which is famous for its 12th century priory and its race course. It's also home to the Cartmel Sticky Toffee Pudding Company, a 
there are plenty of opportunities to sample this at the numerous cafes and restaurants in the village. We were very pleased with the wealth of activities available to keep the kids happy, including acres of fields and forests to explore, trips by steamer boat across the lake, and a kids club. On wet days, the world of Beatrix Potter attraction is not far away, and there's also the lakeside aquarium. Three, listening to identify attitudes. Now choose from the list, A to H, what each speaker expresses. Speaker one. As we tumbled along the river in our raft, I tried to ignore its deafening roar. I was using all my strength to row through the powerful rapids that seemed intent on capsizing our raft. At that moment, I experienced a strange but not altogether unpleasant surge of fear. This must be what adrenaline junkies seek. It was quite invigorating. I was on the Franklin River in Tasmania, and my team consisted of seven other people, including two guides. The following day, after a morning of zipping through a forest of eucalyptus trees, we embarked on a hike up a snow-capped mountain. After an exhausting five-hour trek, those of us that could still stand were rewarded with a breathtaking view. I came back from my holiday fitter and wiser, and with an intense desire to do it all again. Speaker 2. I have a hectic lifestyle. I work long hours and I have little time for rest and recreation. So when I go on holiday, all I want to do is laze by the beach with a good book. When my friend told me that she had discovered an idyllic island paradise, I was all ears. The paradise in question was Zanzibar, an island off the east coast of Africa. I stayed there with my husband in a lovely spa hotel. After a few days of spa treatments, healthy food, lying on the beach and swimming in azure-coloured water, I was completely chilled out. I even went snorkelling one day. It was fascinating to watch the brilliant flashes of colour as the fish zipped past me. I felt happy and refreshed by the end of the holiday. Speaker 3 on our 40th wedding anniversary, my wife and I decided to go on a trip down the Nile. My wife is a big Agatha Christie fan, and when she discovered the ship was holding a death on the Nile-themed night, she was over the moon. We were very pleased with the facilities on the ship. I particularly enjoyed doing lengths in the Olympic-sized pool at the break of dawn, just as a pearly light broke over the horizon. The voyage would have been perfect if it were not for the quality of the food on board, which was, to say the least, of a questionable standard. In fact, my wife took ill for three days after eating from the buffet. Speaker 4. The very thought of this sport used to invoke feelings of dread. So when my friend Sophie suggested I join her on a beginner's course in the Alps, I refused point blank. Fortunately, Sophie doesn't give up easily, and after a few days I gave in. As the cable car made its jerky journey up the snow-covered mountain, I glared angrily at Sophie. She flashed me a happy grin and pointed at a man expertly gliding down the mountain. Our first lesson was not as bad as I thought it would be. In fact, despite my initial terror, I quite enjoyed it. Actually, it's not as hard as it looks. Once I got over my fear of falling, I found myself smugly gliding down hills, and at one point I was even able to look up and take in the beautiful snowy scenery. Speaker 5 Every year we go on holiday to the Lake District. Staying in hotels is too expensive for a family of six, so we prefer to find a nice site and pitch our tents. Anyway, the kids enjoy the sense of adventure that goes with sleeping outdoors. Last summer we stayed in Cartmore, which is famous for its 12th century priory and its race course. It's also home to the Cartmore Sticky Toffee Pudding Company, and there are plenty of opportunities to sample this at the numerous cafes and restaurants in the village. We were very pleased with the wealth of activities available to keep the kids happy, including acres of fields and forests to explore, trips by steamer boat across the lake, 
and a kids club. On wet days, the world of Beatrix Potter attraction is not far away, and there's also the Lakeside Aquarium. Unit 4. Culture. You will hear a segment from a radio program. After the talk, you will be asked some questions about what was said. Read the questions 1 to 5 and guess which topics are discussed in the radio program. It is almost a century since his tomb was excavated, and Tutankhamun, the boy pharaoh, retains an enduring grasp on our popular imagination. Modern science is beginning to unravel the mysteries of the life and death of King Tut. Egyptologists Sean Wilson and Amy Green are here to give us some interesting facts about this fascinating topic. Dr. Wilson? Let me begin by saying that the tombs and bodies of most of the 18th dynasty kings had been discovered by the beginning of the 20th century. Just one king remained. Archaeologists could read Tutankhamun's name in the hieroglyphic inscriptions that decorated ancient monuments, and they realized that he too must have a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Tutankhamun's tomb vanished off the cemetery map when builders, working on the tomb of Ramses VI, allowed the rubble from their excavations to cover his tomb entrance and then built their huts on top of the mound. This. Rather than security measures, saved Tutankhamun from tomb raiders and enabled archaeologists to excavate a tomb which was intact and packed with treasures. Tutankhamun's tomb actually consisted of several rooms. The antechamber was effectively a small warehouse packed with all the goods a king might need in an eternal afterlife. A second, undecorated chamber cut into the western hall held more boxes and bundles. And in the northern wall, was the sealed entrance to the burial chamber. There, Tutankhamun lay within three concentric coffins, housed in a quartzite sarcophagus. The walls of this room were decorated with scenes intended to help the dead king achieve rebirth and eternal life. Finally, there was the treasury, an undecorated subsidiary room holding, among other things, the mummified remains of two baby girls, who Egyptologists believe may have been Tutankhamun's daughters. Dr. Green, Tutankhamun was only 18 when he died. I guess there must be several theories about the cause of his death. Yes, in fact, there are. In 1923, for example, Egyptologist Arthur Mace speculated that Tutankhamun had been killed by his successor, A. Mace produced no evidence to support his theory, but the notion of an ancient murder was put in place. In 1968, anatomist R.G. Harrison carried out x-rays and spotted a detached bone fragment within the skull, but this damage was caused by the post-mortem. Murder theorists focused on an area of thickening at the base of the skull. Was this a hemorrhage caused by a blow? Possibly, but the blow would not necessarily have been a fatal one. In 2005, a team led by archaeologist Zahi Hawass used CT scan analysis to study the body. They confirmed that shortly before his death, Tutankhamun suffered a fracture to the lower left femur, which may have led to blood poisoning and death. They concluded that the king, an active man, died following a chariot or boating accident. Dr. Green, what exactly is facial reconstruction, and how is it used in the case of King Tut? Well, facial reconstruction is a well-established technique and is a means of identifying skeletal remains. The technique relies on the relationship between the soft tissues of the head and face and the underlying bone. In 2005, three teams of experts, one Egyptian, one French, and one American, used facial reconstruction to create three-dimensional models of Tutankhamun's head. The models were based on more than 1,900 CT scan images taken by an Egyptian team led by Dr. Zahi Hawass, who scanned Tutankhamun's body as he lay in his tomb. CT scans generate a 3D image from a series of X-ray images. While the French and Egyptian teams knew that they were working on Tutankhamun, the American team worked blind. Despite this, the three reconstructed heads proved to be strikingly similar in appearance. One final question for you, Dr. Wilson. Does any evidence support the existence of a deadly curse? The legend that the tomb was cursed was born in 1923, when Lord Carnarvon, the man who financed the excavation in Tutankhamun's tomb, died. A rumor was spread that a curse was engraved above the tomb's entrance, warning, 
Death comes on swift wings to those who disturb the rest of the king. Some believe Tutankhamun had set a biological booby trap. Others, that he protected himself with elemental spirits. In 1934, Egyptologist Herbert Winlock studied the fates of all 26 people present at the tomb's opening. Just six had died within a decade. However, according to Dr. Zahi Hawaz, there is no such thing as ancient curses. His point is that the tombs remained closed for 3,000 years, and mummies and organic material create germs. In the past, archaeologists were always in a hurry to enter a tomb, and the germs entered their bodies and killed them. 1. Why was Tutankhamun's tomb intact and full of treasures? of the two baby girls found. Three, what does the latest research concerning Tutankhamun's death suggest? three teams was unaware of the fact that they were working on Tutankhamun. Five. What does Dr. Zahi Hawass think might have been the cause of Lord Carnarvon's death? Module two. Roundup. Listening. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. It was a really enlightening experience. You should have come. I couldn't. I had to work late last night, and I was very tired. So, what sort of entertainment did they have? Well... There was a dance troupe from Cuba. The music was wonderfully melodic and rhythmic. And the dancers, they moved so gracefully. They wore bright, colorful costumes. The performance was vibrant and uplifting, and they got a standing ovation from the audience. Sounds good. Did you get to try any Cuban food? Yes. At the end of the show, we got to sample a few Cuban dishes. However, I was disappointed that there were so few dishes to try from. Only about five or six. I reluctantly tried a sort of puff pastry filled with guava fruit. I had never had guava before, and I wasn't sure if I'd like it, but I was relieved to discover that it was very nice. I wish I had gone. I love trying out new food. There were some Cuban people there who run local businesses. I picked up a fly from a restaurant in town. Would you like to go sometime? Of course. Extract 2. So how long did they say the flight will be delayed for? There's no expected time on the screen. What shall we do? We can't do anything now, so it's best just to find something to occupy yourself with while we wait. Why don't you go and buy a magazine from the shop over there? But we can't stay here all night. What do you suggest we do? Maybe we should go and get a train. <laughs> It's minus 15 degrees outside. All the roads and tracks are covered in snow. Most trains aren't even running. Do you really think that's a good idea? I suppose you're right. It's just we're going to miss the wedding if we don't fly out tonight. Don't jump to conclusions. Look, some of the flights have started taking off now. We'll make it. Don't worry. Extract 3. So how was your trip? It wasn't what I expected. Somehow, I imagined I would wake up to an exotic fruit breakfast. I would then slowly make my way down to the banana plantation, do a bit of work for a few hours, then sidle back to camp for lunch and a nap. Oh dear. These working holidays are hard. I went on one last year to Thailand. I certainly worked hard. On my first morning, I was woken up at the crack of dawn and driven down to the nearby banana jungle. 
I had to help pick bananas. It was hot and tiring work, I tell you. But there was lots of variety. That made it interesting. That sounds exciting. I stopped at lunchtime for a good hearty meal. My next task was to prune trees. That was tough going in the afternoon heat. By the end of the day, I was ready to collapse. Did you have any days off to explore the island? Yeah. On my day off, I went with some of the other volunteers to Magic Sands, a clean, sandy beach. We also went to a farmer's market where I had delicious coconut muffins and guava shave ice, which was really refreshing. So would you do it again? Definitely. Module 3. Be Green. Unit 5. Mother Nature. Listening. Now listen to the short conversations. From the three answer choices given, choose the answer which means about the same thing as what you hear, or that is true based upon what you hear. 1. Is Alice taking part in the Nature Marathon Challenge in Tatton Park on Sunday? She was going to, but she sprained her ankle yesterday. How unlucky is that? That's a shame. She was really looking forward to it. Two. I've never seen such beautiful birds. They're so colorful. I know. They are amazing. Let's take a picture. Oh no, I didn't bring my camera. How annoying. I can take a picture with my phone, but the quality won't be great. It's all right. Better than nothing. Three. So what kinds of conservation work did you do while you were in Australia? I was monitoring endangered marine life in the Great Barrier Reef. It was very exciting. In fact, I would say it was a life-changing experience for me. In what way? Being so close to nature and being able to do something to help protect it gave me a great feeling of achievement. I think I know what I want to do with my life from now on. Four. Do you want to come fishing with me this weekend? Sure, where do you want to go? I was thinking we could drive out to Lake Henry. We can camp on the shore and go fishing during the day. Sounds good to me. I'll bring some home-cooked food that we can heat up over the fire. Five. What was that noise? Did you feel that? Look! I think it's coming from the volcano. We have to get out of here. But the tour guide said it was inactive. Well, maybe she was wrong. Quick, let's go! Six. What was it like going on a safari? It was great. I managed to capture some incredible images of lions. My guide got me really close to a female lion. I was terrified that she would see me and start racing in my direction. My hands were shaking as I focused the camera, but I got some beautiful shots of her. That's impressive. You must have nerves of steel. I think I would have panicked. Seven. What did you think of the fundraising event? It was very successful. We managed to raise $5,000, which we will use to build a new field station in India. Our volunteers over there have been making do with very limited facilities, which has hampered the elephant conservation project. Do you need any more volunteers? I would love to help out in the summer. I can take four weeks off from work. Eight. What did you think of the waterfall? It was awesome. Even better than the one I saw in Greece last summer. I particularly enjoyed jumping off it into the water below. That's dangerous. Don't you know there are rocks in the water? I know, but I really enjoyed the thrill. Nine. Have you bought your new car yet? No, I still can't decide which one I want. Well, just make sure it's an environmentally friendly one. You know how I feel about the subject. Yeah, but the less pollution the car produces, the more expensive it is. Ten. That book about endangered...
endangered tigers was really interesting. Glad you liked it. I have another one about polar bears, but I haven't gotten around to reading it yet. Maybe I'll have some time this weekend. Unit 6. Save the planet. Listening. You will hear an interview with David Grant, who recently returned from taking part in an environmental volunteering project abroad. For questions 1 to 5, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Most people dream of visiting exotic places and doing their bit to help save the environment. One man who has followed his dream is David Grant. David took a year off from his hectic career working as an economist in the city to do volunteer work. He has written a remarkable book about his adventures entitled A Memorable Year. Welcome to the show, David. So, let's start from the beginning. What made you want to take a year out to volunteer? I felt like I was in a rut in my life. I was fed up of the fast pace of life in London. I needed to take a break to recharge my batteries and do something radically different. A friend told me about an environmental project in the Galapagos Islands. They were looking for volunteers to help with a conservation project. It was just what I needed. What were your first impressions of the islands? They are amazing. After living in London for so long, it was such a contrast. It's like entering a place that time has forgotten. Although some of the islands are inhabited by humans, they still remain relatively untouched by the ugliness of industry and commerce. In my first days there, a strange feeling of loss invaded my being and settled uneasily in my stomach. It had finally hit home how important it was to protect the environment from our own actions before it's too late. Tell us, what is so special about the Galapagos Islands? The islands are a unique ecological haven. There are thousands of plant and animal species found there, but they are probably best known for their unusual animal life. Some of the species migrated across the sea, settled there, and an amazing range of subspecies developed from them. While other species, like marine iguanas, can be found only in the Galapagos. Tell us about the project you were involved in. I was working on the habitat conservation project. Specifically, I was responsible for helping to eradicate non-native plant species, which compete with and threaten the local plants and trees. I helped to collect and classify seeds, which would be used for reforestation. This was detailed work, and at times very repetitive. But working with the researchers helped me to understand the science of the project. I planted native trees, and I also helped to maintain a tree nursery. It was hard work, but I enjoyed every minute of it. And did you feel that your work made a difference? Yes, because I got to see the results of my work. Rows of healthy trees were planted, and plants that were struggling to survive started to thrive once the non-native species were removed. I could see how my work was making a positive impact on the island. Now, you didn't just do work in the Galapagos. I believe you were in Colombia for a while. Yes. I worked on a tropical rainforest conservation project in Colombia. I was based in the area encompassing the Gulf of Tribuga. Here, there is a tropical rainforest. As yet, it remains undisturbed by man. There is huge biological diversity of plant and animal life in this area. It gave me the opportunity to learn more about various rare and interesting creatures. The aim of the project was to help preserve the rich biodiversity that exists in the rainforest. Like with the Galapagos, this place is another forgotten world that needs to be treasured and not destroyed by our greed. And what do you feel you have gained from your experiences? I've gained so much. I've increased my knowledge about the environment and conservation. In addition to this, I've improved skills such as communication and team working. Apart from that, I gained a great sense of achievement. But more than anything, I feel I've grown as a person. I feel more at ease with myself, and I'm clear about what's important. Module 3. Roundup. Listening. You will hear an extract from an interview with Ian Kennedy, 
a gardening expert talking about different ways people can bring nature closer to them and at the same time protect the environment. For questions 1 to 5, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Good morning everyone and welcome to today's show. Joining us in the studio is renowned celebrity gardener, Ian Kennedy. Welcome, Ian. Thanks. So, Ian, you're going to tell us how we can get closer to nature without going on a trek into the rainforest. <laughs> yes, well, what many people in cities and towns don't realise is that nature is right on their doorstep. It's just a matter of helping it to thrive. There are lots of things you can do to encourage a little wildlife into your garden or balcony. Most of us harassed city dwellers would love to do a bit of gardening, but we just don't have the time. Is there anything we can do that won't be too time-consuming? There are lots of things you can do in a day, an afternoon, or even in just an hour. Let's start with one of my favorite projects, making a bee home or cafe. This will take you about a day to set up. A bee cafe? Yes. You'd be creating a home for bees to live in and just, well, hang out. Bumblebees are an important part of the ecosystem. They are needed to pollinate trees and flowers. Many bumblebee species are endangered. Some are now even extinct. So it's vital that we help preserve them. Bees need a small box with two rooms. One for the queen to breed in and another for the rest of the bees to live in. I think it's best to try to grow plants like lavender, honeysuckle and poppies, which will attract bees into your garden. In the summer, your garden will come alive with summer blooms and the happy buzz of bumblebees. Now, if you've just got an hour and you would like to attract some more exotic wildlife into your garden, provided you're not frightened of bats, how about putting up a bat box? You can buy them from specialist shops. In order to attract bats, you need to have a good supply of bugs for them to forage. I recommend you dig up a pond. The stagnant water will attract insects. Moths are a very tasty snack for bats. So try to grow night-scented flowers like evening primrose, which will attract moths. You'll be able to sit back and watch your bats fly in and out of their nest. What if you don't have a big garden? Is there anything we can do with a balcony or window ledge? There's a lot you can do on a balcony. You could put down a water tray for birds. You just need a watertight, shallow container. Put a ramp on it so if little birds fall in, they can get out easily. Instead of curling up on your sofa to watch TV, you can curl up and watch your local wildlife. That sounds ideal. And what about livening up a balcony with plants? Right. Well, there are all sorts of potted plants and trees to choose from. The important thing is to make sure your balcony can take the weight. Window boxes with flowers are good if you only have a small balcony. Plant lavender, thyme, rosemary. They don't need a lot of maintenance and they cope well with hot, dry conditions. Bees like lavender and catmint, so put in lots. If you have some space on your balcony, grow sunflowers. Birds love feeding on the seeds in the autumn. Try to choose plants and flowers that are native to where you live. This helps to encourage local wildlife to thrive. That sounds great. Now, if you have an afternoon free, a beach clean is a great idea. This is something I'm trying to get more people involved in because I feel very strongly about protecting our coastlines. Living by the sea as a child, I used to spend my Sundays exploring my local beach and observing all the wildlife. It was a magical time for me and I was very sad upon returning many years later to find my childhood beach nearly destroyed by new holiday developments and pollution in the sea. The huge amount of rubbish that gets washed up on beaches is dangerous for marine wildlife. All you need for a beach clean is a bin bag, a litter picker, or some thick gloves, and a group of people. The more, the merrier. 
If you're not sure if something is safe to pick up, then don't. Put plastic objects in recycle bins. A large amount of litter is lost from fishing boats, and this can end up floating onto beaches. Animals can get caught in the nets and fish. Guys, Guys. Traveller C1 by H.Q. Mitchell. Published and copyright MM Publications, 2010. CD2 Module 4 Healthy Body, Healthy Mind Unit 7 In Sickness and in Health Listening You will hear 16 questions. From the three answer choices given, choose the one which best answers each question. 1. Do you mind if I open the window? I got a great deal on this refrigerator. Three. Oh no, I completely forgot about my doctor's appointment. Think of the movie. Five. I can't stand this song. Six. What are you up to tonight? There's no way we're going to meet the deadline. Eight. Did you see what she was wearing? Nine. May I borrow that book for a while? Did you try the vegetarian lasagna? It's terrible. Eleven. I missed class this morning. Do you have the notes? Let's watch something else. Thirteen. Have you ever been to Mexico? Fourteen. What did the boss want to talk to you about? these shopping bags? Sixteen. What a day. I'm beat. Choose the answer which fits best according to what you hear. Extract 1. 
Hey, Margaret, how did your ballet fitness class go? Oh, hi, Julie. It was great. Very exhilarating. Do you need any previous ballet experience to do it? Not at all. The teacher set up the classes with the aim of making ballet more accessible to people who don't have any formal training. To tell you the truth, I was dreading the first lesson. I half expected to find the class filled with willowy looking preteens wearing pink tutus. I was so relieved when I saw a group of women of all ages mostly dressed in tracksuits. So what did you do? Well, we started with some warm-up exercises, stretches, leg raises. The routines built up steadily, adding turns, twirls, pirouettes, jumps and kicks. We also did some stomach crunches, which were tough. The popular chart music playing in the background gave it an energy. I really got into the rhythm and started enjoying myself. So would you recommend it? If you're bored of aerobics and you want to try something different that's going to really challenge you, then it's ideal. It is quite hard though and it can be frustrating when you don't get it right. I plan to continue with it, so feel free to come along the next time I go. That way you'll be able to see for yourself if it's something you'd like. Extract 2 I've been playing golf for a little over 20 years, but I've only been pro for around 10 of them. I started playing golf in high school and I haven't stopped since. I love the sport, I love the game, but the sport has changed and I can't sound thrilled with some of the developments. Partly, I blame the media for this. They seem to put more emphasis on the personal lives of the players than the game itself. But I mostly blame corporations. You rarely find a pro player now who doesn't do at least a few celebrity endorsements for different products. To me, this completely takes away from the sport. People do the sport for the wrong reason. To make money, not for the love of the game. Another development and very touchy topic is the use of performance enhancing supplements. Personally, I think that they are an unfortunate necessity in the game nowadays. You tell yourself you don't want any performance enhancers, but when you find out that everyone else is using them, it's pretty hard to stay away from them. It's hard to compete against people who have an extra boost of energy to get them through the day when you are tired. So yes, I have taken some muscle building supplements and I drink an energy shake every morning. Of course, I consulted my doctor first and he assured me that these types of things are safe as long as they are used in moderation. Extract 3 Hi Claire, I wasn't expecting to see you here, but I'm glad I did. It saves me from having to call you. I was hoping we could catch a movie tonight. That is, if you're up to it. Oh, that would have been nice, Mohammed. But my sister's taking part in a competition tonight, and I'm going along to give her some moral support. Surely I've told you before that my sister has been the National Rhythmic Gymnastics Champion twice. If she does well tonight, she'll go through to the finals. So she'll be one step closer to winning again. Rhythmic what? Rhythmic gymnastics. It's an Olympic sports activity that combines elements of ballet, gymnastics and dance. It's the kind of sports activity that requires you to have unwavering faith and determination. That's why my sister is so disciplined and systematic when it comes to her training. She trains for five hours a day. Wow, I'm impressed. Small wonder then that she's so athletic and fit. You haven't seen anything yet. She's so flexible, she can bend and twist like an elastic band. So, is this an individual sports activity? These girls compete individually and as a team, so although they tend to be highly competitive, they also need to function well as team players. Care to accompany me tonight? You can help me root for my sister and get a feel for professional sports at the same time. You bet. Module 4. Roundup. Listening. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. Wow, Kylie, you look fantastic. 
When you said on the phone that you'd lost weight, I never imagined you meant that you'd undergone a complete transformation. What exactly is it that you did to get such wonderful results? Thanks for the compliment, Victor. Well, I've been on a raw food diet ever since we last saw each other, which was a while ago. In fact, I don't eat anything that is processed or cooked, and I also buy organic foods. That obviously means you don't eat any meat or poultry, right? I never used to eat meat, poultry or fish before going on this diet anyway, because I've been a vegetarian for the last eight years, silly. Don't act surprised. You and I have known each other since primary school and we've spoken about this several times before. What you may not know is that about a year ago I became a vegan, which meant that I stopped eating dairy products and eggs as well. Now I've just taken it a step further. What's got into you, Kylie? How can you possibly survive on eating just raw fruit and vegetables? There are bound to be nutritional deficiencies related to eating like this. You're harming yourself and you don't even know it. Relax, Victor. Before going on the raw food diet, I did a lot of research by reading books written by experienced raw foodists. The point is that one has got to know where to look for certain nutrients to maintain a balanced intake of them. I'm not saying it's easy, but I feel great. Suit yourself. Extract 2. There was a very interesting debate on community alert yesterday night. I actually stayed up until way after 12 watching it. It was about the fat tax that we've been hearing so much about. I was hardly astounded to hear that two-thirds of Americans are afflicted by the obesity epidemic and that over 26% of children who enter kindergarten are clinically overweight or obese. All one has to do to verify that is look around. The statistics really bring it home, however, how serious the situation is. Under the circumstances, I think the government should impose a fat tax on unhealthy foods. Making fatty, sugary and salty foods more expensive is sure to deter people from over-consuming them. Do you know that food-related diseases account for $147 billion a year in medical bills? So something definitely needs to be done to reduce consumer demand. You may be right, Saeed. The truth of the matter is that there is an easily accessible, abundant and economical supply of unhealthy food. And it's also true that the government plays a role in subsidizing its production to such an extent that it is both cheaper to produce and buy than healthier options such as fruit and vegetables. So if the government wishes to address this obesity epidemic, it has to deal with the socio-economic incentives that result in people, especially low-income families, consuming harmful food. So by all means, tax fatty foods, but also subsidize the production of fresh produce so that it is economical to buy. Extract 3 being under the misconception that weight training is suitable only for men makes women wary of taking it up. They fear that they will end up looking like beefy bodybuilders. But this widely held misconception is actually far from the truth. Increased muscle does not mean increased masculinity. A bulky butch physique cannot easily be obtained by women as they have a very low level of testosterone, a male hormone which is responsible for enhanced muscle development. In truth, both men and women have much to gain from engaging in weight training. A regular workout, when combined with a healthy, energy-neutral diet, can help you boost your basal metabolic rate by up to 15%, which means you end up burning more calories per day than when you engage in other activities. Building muscle can also help strengthen tendons and ligaments, which means that this type of exercise is ideal for battling muscle mass decline, the reduction of which results in a loss of balance, flexibility and stamina, evident as we age. And if this is not enough, resistance training has been clinically proven to ward off diseases like osteoporosis, diabetes, cancer and heart conditions. So weight training is not only about looking good, that's just a bonus. It's about wellness and immunity, the benefits you reap will last for the rest of your lives. Module 5. Modern Times. Unit 9. Consumerism. Listening. 
You will hear an interview with Paul Hanks, a member of the International Fair Trade Association. For questions 1 to 5, choose the answers A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. With us in the studio is Paul Hanks, a member of the International Fair Trade Association, an umbrella group of organizations in more than 70 countries. Welcome, Paul, and thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Many people will have heard of the fair trade movement, which aims to help producers in developing countries, and they may have even bought products with the fair trade label on them. But this does not necessarily reflect a true understanding of the fair trade initiative. That's why I'm genuinely grateful for any opportunity given to me to enlighten consumers about this venture, as consumer awareness, sensitivity and involvement are required to ensure its success. You see, the essence of fair trade lies in ensuring the well-being of marginalized small producers in developing countries who are struggling to make ends meet and maintain an acceptable standard of living. They are the ones that are either unscrupulously exploited by international marketeers or eliminated by the cutthroat competition of free trade. In other words, fair trade aims to do away with inequalities in the relationship between rich nations and the developing world. Well, fair trade will never be the answer to such a complicated problem, but it can and does help small producers achieve economic self-sufficiency and stability. This it does by offering better trading conditions as it ensures that prices are stable, not determined by the fickle nature of demand and supply, and that members of consortiums certified as fair trade receive a guaranteed premium, in other words, a sum of money in addition to the normal cost. This premium boosts their earning potential and enhances their standard of living. So, correct me if I'm wrong, Fair Trade is a trading partnership that helps marginalised producers secure their place in the international market and in doing so alleviates poverty. Exactly. But fair trade is not only concerned with the economic well-being of small producers. It actually helps them develop knowledge, skills and resources to improve their lives. To get fair trade certification, farmers need to adhere to prerequisites that determine eligibility. Do you mean a list of rules that they must stick to? Yes. Rules that involve things like agricultural practices, which need to be environmentally friendly and sustainable. Use of pesticides, which are limited to ensure the farmers as well as the consumer's safety. And even issues regarding recycling and the use of waste products, such as coffee skins, for the production of fuel for processing plants. And these are just a few. So, certification enables them to access expertise and know-how, and amass capital that can be utilised to build a better infrastructure which benefits not only individual producers, but the community as a whole. Premiums often finance community projects, like schools and drinkable water, that facilitate social development. I see. What about child labour? Some families in these developing countries are so poor that every member of the family, regardless of age or gender, needs to work to put bread on the table. Many of these children have never seen the inside of a school. This is a sad fact. A UNICEF survey recently revealed the severity of child labour and the extent of the physical and emotional abuse experienced by these children. The results were shocking. Children in many countries work over 10 hours a day under very difficult conditions for wages that amount to no more than 20 pence a day. The families of these children are so poor that no alternative course of action is at hand. The Fair Trade Initiative helps alleviate problems like this, as it makes it possible for parents to earn a living while educating their children at the same time. You see, to obtain certification, farmers have to show that their children are enrolled in school. So, even if they don't want to send their children to school, they are forced to. Certified farms are visited fairly regularly by various organisations to verify adherence to criteria, such as a ban on child labour. That's good to know. So what do consumers need to do to support the Fair Trade Initiative? They need to look out for the Fair Trade label and buy the large variety of products available on the market now. 
Products range from things like rice, nuts and fruit juices to footballs, clothes and jewellery. Although fair trade produce accounts for only a small percentage of the produce sold on a global scale, there has been substantial growth. For instance, in 2008, sales of fair trade goods rose by a staggering 70%. People do care. All I'm asking is for them to carry on caring and spread the word. Money spent on fair trade goods is money well spent. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. You all have your work cut out for you. Paul Hanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Unit 10, high tech, listening. A, you will hear a radio interview about biomimetics, an area of science which uses nature's designs to solve problems. For questions one to eight, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Here with us today is Professor Frank Jacobs, who is going to tell us more about an innovative area of science called biomimetics or biomimicry. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to share my enthusiasm about this exciting field. Let me start by defining biomimetics. The term literally means imitating nature, and this is done with a view to seeking sustainable solutions to human problems. You see, nature has, over the course of millions of years and through the process of evolution, established time-tested forms and processes which are highly efficient. We now seek to comprehend and apply these forms and processes to achieve sustainable development. In layman's terms, we make machines that mimic what natural organisms do in their efforts to adapt to the natural environment. The termite is a good example of a highly adaptive natural organism. Termites are small insects which live in sub-Saharan Africa. They are able to build homes or mounds which maintain a constant temperature regardless of extreme variations brought on by their hostile habitat. By examining termite mounds, scientists were able to copy the construction and apply it to building design. In fact, the Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe is an example where this has been successfully utilized. The building is able to keep cool without the use of air conditioning and uses much less energy than buildings of similar size. What many people don't realize is that nature is full of answers. Developments in measurement techniques such as electron and atomic microscopy have allowed us to study organisms in more detail. So we have been able to learn how their shapes are formed and determine what materials are used in their construction. In fact, various shapes found in nature have already been mimicked. For instance, the automobile industry has designed cars based on boxfish and kingfishers to make them more aerodynamic and fuel efficient. Replicating the shapes of various organisms prevalent in the natural environment is one thing, while mimicking the complex processes that make them highly adaptive is quite another. A degree of success has nevertheless been achieved in this area. One such success story has yielded material which is able to attract and capture water and channel it in a specific direction. Scientists got their inspiration from a beetle which lives in the Namib Desert in Africa, one of the hottest and driest places on Earth. This beetle is able to collect tiny droplets of water on its wings from a light fog which arises in the early morning by using a combination of water attracting and repelling elements. This complicated mechanism plays an essential role in ensuring its survival. The know-how provided by this discovery is sure to play a significant role in places where it is hard to collect water. Equally fascinating and valuable is research on making vehicles such as aeroplanes, which are able to heal themselves if damaged. This research is inspired by the observation and study of organisms which have self-healing abilities like ourselves. Complex materials known as self-healing plastics release a resin when damaged that helps to mend cracks that may appear due to stress. 
These plastics are lighter and will thus help make vehicles not only safer, but also fuel efficient. There are, however, some designs in nature that are near impossible to replicate. The abalone sea snail is able to create an extremely efficient body armor out of chalk. It is the way the layers of chalk are arranged that makes it 3,000 times harder than ordinary chalk. Military organizations are very interested in the armor, but as yet, scientists have been unable to replicate it. Another challenging material is spider silk. It is a natural elastic. Spider silk is a versatile material which could be used for a wide variety of purposes ranging from medical to military. Cosmetic companies have used diatoms, which are a form of algae, to make cosmetics that give the wearer a natural sheen. Although nature is highly sophisticated in its design, we have, upon close examination, found that most materials are made from simple substances such as keratin, calcium carbonate, and silica. It's the way these materials are manipulated by the organisms that makes them so clever. It will take a lot of dedication and perseverance to tap this know-how, but if we do, the possibilities are endless. Biomimetics is the future. It has the potential to revolutionize the fields of engineering, medicine, and architecture. I personally feel that one of the most exciting applications of biomimicry is the creation of robots. If we can create robots that can replicate various forms of animal movement, such as crawling, swimming, climbing, and flying, we could produce robots with the capacity to explore other planets and the deepest oceans. They could even be used in medicine to examine internal organs and diagnose illnesses. B. You will hear an interview with Dr. Adrian Brown about touch technology. For questions 1 to 5, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Please welcome Dr. Adrian Brown, who is here today to tell us about the emerging science of touch technology. So, Adrian, can you tell us what exactly touch technology is? Well, it's the use of computers to simulate the human sense of touch. Touch is an extremely important sense for humans. It gives us information about surfaces and textures. When you touch an object, sensory cells within your body send messages to your brain, which then interprets those messages. But how can a computer sense touch? We copy the feeling of touch by using vibrations or forces. The technology allows us to investigate the science of human touch, which in turn allows us to develop more sophisticated touch devices. Essentially, we are creating the illusion of texture and weight. What is the technology used for? Well, for example, anyone who's ever played a computer game with a joystick will have experienced touch technology. The more advanced games can even simulate touching objects, which can change textures according to your choice. But the most important use so far has been in the medical field, where computers are used to create virtual environments. This is particularly useful to medical students, who can simulate medical procedures without the need to touch and, more importantly, hurt a patient. A team in Japan has recently developed a robotic surgical device which has a sense of touch. The team created sensors on the device, which measure how much pressure the robot applies to the body. If too much pressure is applied, a visual response is shown on a computer monitor. That's fascinating. So tell us, what does the future hold for touch technology? The possibilities are endless. But one of the areas researchers are currently working on is enabling customers who buy products online to actually feel the products before they buy them. Are you saying we might one day be able to reach into the computer screen and feel the texture of an apple? Exactly. Scientists are working on creating a virtual environment which allows shoppers to interact with the products on the internet 
just as they would if they were in a shop. Of course, you wouldn't be able to taste the products, but imagine being able to reach into your computer and smell perfume before you buy it. In addition, scientists are looking at developing the technology for artistic uses. There is currently a product on the market which copies the look and feel of clay and allows users to create sculptures. It sounds as if the possibilities are endless. Am I to assume that this type of technology can somehow be utilized to enhance the lives of the physically challenged? Of course. We are becoming increasingly sensitive to issues concerning this marginalized minority, and technological advancements can definitely help us create equal opportunities for them. For instance, the availability of user-friendly touch screens with a braille interface for the visually impaired improve accessibility and productivity making working in an office possible for those challenged in this way. And that is not all. It is common practice for people to access the net to view visual mapping systems. These are of course of little use when it comes to the visually impaired. MIT has developed a device that lets blind people feel themselves around a room or building before going there. This preview enables them to deal with the experience of visiting an unfamiliar place. You see, a robot arm grasped by the user acts as a cane, which allows him to feel his way around a virtual environment and pinpoint landmarks for improved navigation in the real environment. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Imagine the potential inherent in this kind of technology for people who have lost a limb. This is amazing stuff. But does this technology have limitations? Of course, there are many obstacles we still have to overcome. There is the question of finding funding for projects. But the main problem is that computers are not yet fast enough to accurately mimic our sense of touch. In order to copy exactly how the world feels to us, the computer must constantly update information. And even our own sense of touch is not quite perfect. For example, two pins pressed to a fingertip will feel like one pin if they are less than a millimeter apart. We must continue to study the nature of our sense of touch if we want these plans to become a reality. If you've just joined us, I'm here with Dr. Adrian Brown, whose research focuses on touch technology. Module 5. Roundup. Listening. You'll hear an interview with Barry Schneider, a social activist interested in protecting and informing consumers. For questions 1 to 9, Complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. With us today in the studio is Barry Schneider, a member of the Global Grassroots Consumer Association, or GGCA, and publisher of In the Picture magazine. GGCA was established in 1999 as an independent, non-profit organization and it has since become an informative and powerful consumer lobby group. Barry, thanks for joining us today. The pleasure is all mine, Sally. Let me begin by saying that as consumers, we all take it for granted that there is someone out there watching our backs. Nowadays, this may be true, to a certain extent, in that the government has created many regulatory agencies that act as consumer watchdogs. But this has not always been the case. Instead, social activists have been the champions of consumer rights, and they have blazed trails in protecting consumers from dangerous products and unscrupulous manufacturers. These efforts, as strange as it may seem, stretch back to the beginning of the 20th century. Are the roots of consumer protection as we know it today as deep as that, Barry? Perhaps even deeper, but we can use the 1900s as the focal point of our discussion. For instance, I am sure that a large majority of Americans are unaware of the fact that the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act which protect consumers to this day, were passed in 1906. They are also, I am sure, unaware of the fact that these acts were passed only after the gruesome conditions in the meatpacking industry in Chicago were revealed by a crusading author named Upton Sinclair in a book he published, The Jungle. This book acted as an incentive for President Theodore Roosevelt, who upon reading it, sent federal agents to find out if conditions were as bad as Sinclair described. What agents found was so shocking that... Within months, the U.S. Congress had passed the acts that protect the U.S. public today. Who could have imagined that laws that protect us today 
were passed so many years ago. And that is just one example. There are countless more worth mentioning, but given the time limit, I'll just mention two. Ralph Nader, a political activist interested in consumer protection and environmentalism, helped bring about the reform in automobile safety. His publications, one in 1959 titled The Safe Car You Can't Buy, and another in 1965 titled Unsafe at Any Speed, generated a lot of publicity about escalating nationwide traffic fatalities. The awareness he created led to a public outcry, which culminated in the unanimous passage of the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, which made car manufacturers liable for automobile safety. This is, in fact, what helped revolutionize the automobile industry in that it led to the introduction of a series of safety features which have undoubtedly since then saved many lives. Another publication that prompted reform was that of marine biologist Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. Her controversial book, which was published in the 1960s, brought to light the scandalous effects of chemicals such as DDT and other pesticides. Her research revealed that by entering the food chain, these chemicals not only kill wildlife, but also cause serious illnesses in human beings. The situation came to the fore when additional research revealed traces of toxic chemicals in breast milk. Within a decade, this revelation had had a profound impact and led to the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, which continues to play an invaluable role in issues concerning the protection of the environment and their subsequent effect on our health. So what you're saying, Barry, is that social activists have been the ones who have been taking bold steps forward in issues that concern consumer protection. My point exactly. The government tends to follow the lead of social activists, who seem to be more attuned to issues that concern our safety and well-being. They have been the ones that have changed the way government bureaucracies protect the public. It is thus evident that our input as consumers is valued, and we must perceive it as our responsibility to keep our eyes peeled and our ears tuned. You see, the wide variety of choice in the marketplace and recent advances in information technology may be exciting prospects, but they hold hidden dangers that could spiral out of control. Consumers are thus required to be on their guard and act as social champions of consumer rights. The onus is on you to look out for indiscretions and report them to consumer organizations, whose role is to establish and enforce consumer rights. In other words, non-governmental organizations, consumer organizations, and civil society groups have a particularly important role to play. Yes, their mandate and experience places them in a strategically important position. But what I'm trying to say is that each and every consumer has a role to play, and this role needs to be taken seriously. Our lives and personal safety are at stake here, and we have every right to demand safer practices in the manufacture of products that we use or consume. Consumer protection does not jeopardize the rights of consumers. What does work against the rights of consumers is the absence of industry regulation. So, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Get actively involved. It's in your best interests. Module 6. Social Issues. Unit 11. Human Relationships. Listening. A. You will hear four different extracts. For questions 1 to 8, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. I've been teaching for over 20 years in one of the toughest neighborhoods in town, and I can assure you it's not easy, because a lot of these children are subjected to situations that are highly stressful. Some of them have experienced situations that even adults would find difficult to deal with. A large majority come from broken homes and the victims of poverty, violence and neglect. There is also a high rate of absenteeism due to truancy and illness. So as you can well imagine, when they do come to school, they do so carrying a lot of emotional baggage. I can't just walk in and start teaching, it just won't work. For me, it's more a case of creating an environment that's both therapeutic and conducive to learning. To do that, I have to establish rapport with these children and foster open communication so that they can get what's bothering them off their chests. They require unconditional acceptance and empathy, not hardcore discipline as some of my colleagues wrongly believe. To draw these children in, you have to know where they're coming from and how to engage their attention and make them want to learn 
not make them feel persecuted and misunderstood. If you do this, you're just part of the system they hate and rebel against. Extract 2 I've often been confronted by parents who have admitted feeling guilty and inadequate in dealing with their children who have been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So let me start off by saying that you are only human and conflicting emotions are normal. Still, there is no reason for you to feel overwhelmed, even when mistakes are made. Because there are things that can be done to regulate your child's condition. Knowing what to expect will definitely make it easier for you to deal with your child. So educate yourself about the disorder. Find out what the symptoms are and what courses of action are available to you. You can start by accepting the fact that neither you nor your child are to blame for his condition and that an ADHD diagnosis is not a sign of inferior intelligence or a handicap. As a responsible parent, you must give your child his medication, monitor his diet, and ensure the provision of therapy, which helps him learn to control symptoms such as disruptive racing thoughts and impulsive behavior. But you must also cater for his need for social, moral, and emotional support. Never underestimate the power of a loving, supportive, and stable home environment. For your child to grow up into a well-adjusted adult, you need to help him identify his strengths and talents, offer him sincere praise for his accomplishments, and help him envision a positive future. Do everything you do with love, and you will reap the benefits of your perseverance and dedication. Extract 3 You know how I'm always going on about my son and daughter incessantly fighting with each other? Well, I watched a really interesting program yesterday about sibling rivalry and how to deal with it. Specialists say that parents should resist the urge to sort the problem out because this does little to help children develop good conflict resolution skills. From what was said, I realise that I have been doing exactly what I shouldn't have because in my efforts to deal with the situation, I end up taking sides. The point is that parents need to let children work out problems for themselves. This entails ignoring the fighting and never taking sides. That's true. But you might never need to if you teach your children how to resolve their problems. You need to come to some kind of a consensus as to what behaviour is unacceptable during a conflict and set consequences for when rules are broken. My wife gets our children to say how they feel and helps them come up with alternatives to fighting or yelling. It works quite well, actually, and so does encouraging respect by praising them when they handle conflict well. You know, a degree of sibling rivalry is inevitable. Just remember to follow through and stick to the ground rules. Extract 4 Take a look at this article on the effects of birth order on personality. Firstborns, like my brother, are considered to be the most privileged because they have exclusive rights to the family's resources and undivided parental attention, even if it is for just a short period of time. They're also supposed to have, on average, a higher IQ than younger siblings, which I don't quite believe, and apparently fare better than their siblings career-wise due to the high expectations parents place on them. Their maturity and down-to-earth qualities seem to discern them from us lesser mortals. We, as middleborns, are said to get the worst deal because we struggle to develop a clear identity after spending years sandwiched between siblings. As people-pleasers, we're always compromising and avoiding confrontations. <laughs> Try that on for size. Relax. Don't take what you read to heart. Okay. I can admit to feeling overshadowed by my older brother. I found competing with him both frustrating and disheartening. You see, he's always been the apple of my mother's eye. To get her attention, though, I got up to all sorts of things. I experimented and took risks and turned out to be quite a rebel during adolescence. Look, that actually fits the profile of a third-born, not a second-born sibling. So much for birth order theory and its profound effect on personality. B. You will hear a psychologist, Mark Ryan, 
and an editor of a popular women's magazine, Teresa Fuller, discussing friendship. For questions one to six, decide whether the opinions are expressed by only one of the speakers or whether the speakers agree. Write M for Mark, T for Teresa, or B for both where they agree. Today we're discussing friendship. With me is psychologist Mark Ryan, whose new book tells us how we are putting unrealistic demands on our friendships. Also with us today is Teresa Fuller from the women's magazine Happy Living. Welcome to the show. Let's start with Mark. Please tell us what kinds of unrealistic demands we are putting on our friends. Yes, well, we are constantly being shown perfect images of friendship on the TV. But take, for instance, Friends, Grey's Anatomy and Desperate Housewives. These are popular series which portray friendship as a perfect relationship. No wonder most of us get disappointed when our friends do something to upset or annoy us. The way we think about friends is being strongly influenced by this constant exposure to artificial friendships. It's true that the entertainment industry provides us with unrealistic hopes, but I do think we should have high expectations of our friends. After all, they are the people we have chosen to spend our time with. They are the chosen few with whom we will reassess the values and behavioural codes we have acquired from our upbringing. So yes, it's fitting for us to have high expectations, as these will determine both the quality and standard of our social relationships. So if, for instance, we expect to be treated with respect, then we will be. But if we wish to sustain rewarding social relationships, we cannot place unreasonable demands on our friends. We can't expect them to make all the compromises and conform to our specifications. I'll give you an example. A young woman I know says she argues with her best friend more than anyone else. They argue over everything and anything, from clothes to food to careers to what time to meet at their local cafe. But the key is they both have a good sense of humour and they never hold grudges, so arguments are quickly forgotten. When I asked the woman if she would prefer her friend to be less argumentative and more agreeable, she said no. This means that she values her relationship, and it is obviously strong and healthy. She said that her friend was someone she could always rely on in troubled times. This relationship encapsulates the essence of a work in progress, a symbiosis that through time improves and grows stronger. Not a fake TV friendship that is stereotypical and stagnant. Research has shown that we establish deep, emotional, enduring bonds with very few people, usually those with whom we can experience emotional growth and self-fulfillment and to accept us unconditionally for who we are. These programs do nevertheless provide us with something to aspire to. Granted, they are exaggerated, but on the whole, I believe they are a reflection of how our society should be. We can learn from them and build better relationships with our friends. I strongly disagree. We shouldn't allow the media to control how we think. And most importantly, how we interact with others. Friendship is, according to research, the new social glue. It is playing an increasingly important role in holding societies together, as social bonds are different from what they were 60 years ago. From a social standpoint, Friendships have become more important to us than family and kin. Social studies confirm this and identify various factors as being responsible. One is a result of practical necessity, as increased mobility has resulted in us traversing long distances to find better socio-economic opportunities. So we no longer necessarily live close to our family and next of kin. For this reason, our friends often replace our family in terms of the emotional support they provide us. Our expectations and aspirations are thus growing, as our friends are expected to fill that emotional void that's been left by the absence of blood ties. Keep in mind that we tend to accept the shortcomings of family members, but are annoyed or disillusioned when our friends fall short of the mark. This is because we expect them to go out of their way to understand, 
empathize and facilitate us. Yes, that's why we need to learn how to behave towards our friends. I agree with you there. I recently did a study which showed that most people have, on average, about 10 close friends. Our relationship with all of them is usually completely different. There are, in fact, different categories of friends that serve specific roles in our lives. There are the friends who are supporters. They're always there for us in a crisis. Then there are the fun friends. We call them up when we want to enjoy ourselves. Then there are those friends that we've had from childhood, who we don't much keep in contact with, but when we do call them up, it feels like we've just picked up from where we left off. Then there's the friend that's really an enemy in disguise. This is the person we compete with and most want to be like. We often feel inferior to this person, and time spent with them usually leaves us feeling low about ourselves. We should recognize and appreciate these different friends, and not expect things that they are not capable of giving. After all, every relationship has its limitations. I would also like to point out that if a friendship is becoming toxic, that is to say, if after seeing or communicating with a friend you are always left with negative feelings, then it's best to end the friendship. We don't need to be around people who make us feel bad about ourselves. My sentiments exactly. But that's easier said than done. We often feel guilty about ending friendships because we've placed so much importance on them. It's like we're ending a relationship with a family member. Unit 12. Against the law. Listening. You will hear a segment from a radio program followed by five questions. From the three answer choices given, choose the one that best answers each question according to the information you heard. In today's modern world, there are more and more gadgets to make our lives easier. The problem is that most people have a hard time putting those gadgets down, even when they're driving. In recent years, the number of accidents as a result of distracted drivers with gadgets like cell phones has increased dramatically. Brent Summers reports. Cell phones are an extremely convenient device, and with few exceptions, everyone has theirs on them at all times. The problem is, these days people rely on their cell phones too much and can't even stop using them while driving. This is a tremendous hazard not only for the driver, but for other drivers on the same road. People who use cell phones while driving are four times as likely to have an accident. This is because using a cell phone, no matter what the reason, has a negative impact on your ability to concentrate and, subsequently, on your reaction time. So if you're distracted and need to make a split-second decision, it's unlikely that you'll be able to do so if you're busy on your cell phone. Cell phones actually provide several means of distraction, talking, texting, emailing, playing games, and using the internet. It might be hard to believe, but we see accidents every day on the roads caused by people trying to do these things while driving. Helen Carter, public relations representative for the Department of Transportation, has more. That's right, Brent. People are definitely preoccupied with their cell phones while driving, and this, as you can well imagine, places the general public at risk. Small wonder, then, that many states are making new laws regarding the use of handheld devices while driving. Since 1997, various cities have been taking matters into their own hands in terms of road safety and cell phones. But it has been within the past few years that a nationwide awareness concerning this fast-growing problem has become common. The first major city to outlaw handheld devices while driving was New York City in 2001. Since this unprecedented law was put into effect, many other cities and states have followed suit. Now, this doesn't mean that it's against the law to use a cell phone in times of an emergency. Of course, that's okay. However, if you are caught using your cell phone without the hands-free headset in any of these states, the Highway Patrol has every authority to pull you over and give you a ticket. If you are in a city or state that does not have a ban, it's certainly not against the law to use your phone while driving. But it is ill-advised, and you should think twice about it, regardless of what the law says. So the question is, what sort of measures are being taken now or can be taken in the future, and how effective are they, or will they be? Well, 
We have to accept and realize that technology is going to be a part of our everyday lives. A recent survey found that the monthly text messages in December 2008 was 110.4 billion. That's more than 10 times the number three years before. It's clear that people are using their phones more and more every year. Today, lawmakers are trying to find a middle ground, but lack of uniformity in the application of laws is the cause of a lot of confusion. You see, each state has its own set of laws. This means that a driver going from one state to the next might not be aware of prevailing laws. So he or she might be caught breaking the law without necessarily being at fault. Drivers thus have a responsibility to know the laws in the states they are traveling to. In the future, I think that a nationwide ban makes the most sense. Currently, six states have a statewide ban on handheld cell phone devices. This also includes using devices for texting and other things. Some states have bans on cell phones for talking, but not texting. Many cities in other states have these bans in specific places, but not the entire state. I'm sure this uncertainty as to what applies has people in sixes and sevens because it's not only confusing, but also highly ineffective. It's my opinion that lawmakers should strive to obtain a nationwide cell phone ban while driving. In the past, there was some concern that these laws would be too hard to enforce. But surveys conducted suggest otherwise. Those that responded in the survey overwhelmingly support a ban. 80% are in favor of a ban on texting and emailing while driving, whereas 67% say they are for a prohibition on phone calls while driving. Also, out of the people who currently use their cell phones while driving, 82% of those people who were surveyed say they would stop doing so if cell phone usage were restricted by law. It's clear that many want the change to happen. At this point, it's just up to lawmakers to do something about it. A major step in the right direction was taken earlier this year, when all federal employees were prohibited from using their phones while driving. One, according to Brent Summers, what is true of cell phones? Two, what is the main problem caused by cell phone usage on the road? Three, what was a result of the cell phone ban in New York City in 2001? think should be done. Five. According to surveys, what would probably happen if a nationwide ban were to be put into place? Module 6. Roundup. Listening. You will hear part of a discussion in which two friends, Fred and Ashna, are discussing a film they have each seen recently. For questions 1 to 6, decide whether the opinions are expressed by only one of the speakers or whether the speakers agree. Write F for Fred, A for Ashna, or B for both where they agree. Hi, Fred. Your sister told me that you took my advice and went to see Avatar at the weekend. Were you as impressed as I was? I was totally bowled over by it, and it's not only due to the visual effects, which I found unparalleled. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. I was literally spellbound. Uh, I must admit that Avatar is the most visually stunning movie I've ever seen. The visual effects had a lasting as well as a profound impact on me. And I found myself thinking about what I had seen for days later. But it was the visual aesthetic which did it for me, not the film itself. You see, a work of art, which this undoubtedly is as far as visual effects are concerned, must have something to say to its audience. It fell dismally short of my expectations in this area. It was, if you don't mind me saying, empty. 
How can you possibly call a movie like Avatar empty? Its plot is run off the mill in that it's predictable, and you have a pretty good idea how things are going to turn out, but you can hardly call it empty. When I use that word, I mean that the movie left me feeling indifferent, that I was in no way affected by it. Is that what you mean? Absolutely. The whole thing was a well-worn cliché, and when something is as foreseeable as that, you can't possibly feel emotionally moved by the experience. If this experience did not move you, then what will? I personally was touched by the injustice experienced by the Navi people. I felt angry when the military forces destroyed their home tree. I identified with their plight and reveled in their liberty from the armed forces. When a film has the capacity to move you and rouse you such a plethora of emotions, you can hardly call it empty. I was in there living every experience. All I'm saying is that the story was a bit bland, and that an unpredictable twist or a touch of suspense would have gone a long way in making it a powerful means of communication. These elements, combined with audiovisual effects, can help bring home the severity of certain issues. James Cameron undoubtedly had a particular agenda in mind when he wrote the story. Certain themes, such as imperialism and ecology, lie at the heart of Avatar. But the impact that could have been achieved is not, because the story is not unique enough to arouse a renewed interest in time-worn issues such as these. I've already agreed with you on the predictability of the plot, but I can't say that this lessened the impact that the presentation of social issues had on me. I personally think that the simplicity and familiarity of the plot helps you focus on central issues. Instead of getting tied up in untangling the details of a sophisticated storyline, you can focus on the issues at hand. Fair enough, Ashna. So, which issues made the most impact on you? Well, given that I'm a visual type, I was most affected by the portrayal of environmental issues. I was heartbroken with the destruction of the home tree. The visual impact was heartrending. Perhaps because, as the adage goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. In this case, it clearly indicates the unscrupulous destruction of the natural environment. I was also most touched by the presentation of balance and interconnectedness of all living things. You know, the sacred tree of souls, Ewa, and how it connects the Navi with their ancestors. Remember the scene where the Navi connect to Ewa to pray? Powerful messages. Hmm. I think if I were to pinpoint a particular issue, I would choose the dark side of human nature. It definitely contrasts with the nature of the Navi. That man inevitably uses brute force to get what he wants, when he wants it, without thinking of the consequences, is definitely made clear. But come to think of it, you're right. Those two scenes in particular make quite an impact. Hey, Jessica and I are going to watch the 3D version this weekend. Care to come with us? Thanks, but no thanks. Anyway, that's the version I watched. It's been hailed as the groundbreaking 3D release of its time, actually. And mind you, it's setting a precedent because the quality was very good. I reckon that if you were so impressed with the conventional version, this version will completely blow your mind because it adds a new dimension to it. Okay, then. Got to run. I'm meeting Jessica in about 30 minutes and I have...